Appendix B, Part Two of Through the Brazilian Wilderness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Clifton. Through the Brazilian Wilderness by Theodore Roosevelt. Appendix B, The Outfit for Traveling in the South American Wilderness, Part Two. Some experiments have been made lately with the use of mate in the German army, and probably it would be a valuable beverage for use with our own troops. Two plates and a cup, knife, fork, and spoon should be provided for each member of the party. The United States Army mess kit would serve admirably. Each man's mess kit should be numbered to correspond with the number on his duffel bag. An aluminum kettle for lightness cooking outfit, or the Dutch oven mentioned, with three or four kettles nested within, a coffee pot or teapot would suffice, the necessary large spoons and forks for the cook, a small meat grinder, and a half dozen skinning knives could all be included in the fiber case. These outfits are usually sold with the cups, plates, etc. for the table. As before suggested, each member of the party should have his own mess kit. It should not be carried with the general cooking outfit. By separating the eating equipments thus, one of the problems of hygiene and cleanliness is simplified. Rifles, Ammunition A heavy rifle is not advised. The only animals that can be classed as dangerous are the jaguar and white-jawed peccary, and a thirty thirty or forty four caliber is heavy enough for such game. The forty four caliber Winchester or Remington carbine is the arm generally used throughout South America, and forty four caliber is the only ammunition one can depend on securing in the field. Every man has his own preference for an arm. However, there is no need of carrying a nine or ten pound weapon when a rifle weighing only from six and three fourths to seven and one half pounds will do all that is necessary. I personally prefer a small caliber rifle as it can be used for birds also. The three barreled gun, combining a double shotgun and a rifle, is an excellent weapon and it is particularly valuable for the collector of natural history specimens. A new gun has just come on the market which may prove valuable in South America, where there is such a variety of game, a four-barrel gun, weighing only eight and one-fourth pounds. It has two shotgun barrels, one thirty to forty-four caliber rifle, and the rib separating the shotgun barrels is bored for a twenty-two caliber rifle cartridge. The latter is particularly adapted for the large food birds, which a heavy rifle bullet might tear. 22 caliber ammunition is also very light and the long 22 caliber exceedingly powerful unless in practice it proves too complicated it would seem to be a good arm for all-round use 16 to 20 gauge is large enough for the shotgun barrels too much emphasis cannot be placed upon the need of being provided with good weapons after the loss of all our arms in the rapids we secured four poor rusty rifles which proved of no value we lost three deer a taper, and other game, and finally gave up the use of the rifles, depending on the hook and line. A twenty-five or thirty caliber high-power automatic pistol with six or seven inch barrel would prove a valuable arm to carry always on the person. It could be used for large game, and yet would not be too large for food birds. It is to be regretted that there is nothing in the market of this character. We had our rifle ammunition packed by the UMC company in zinc cases of 100 rounds each, a metallic strip with pull ring closing the two halves of the box. Shot cartridge, 16 gauge, were packed in the same way, 25 to the box. The explorer would do well always to have on his person a compass, a light waterproof bag containing matches, a waterproof box of salt, and a strong light linen or fresh silk line, with several hooks, a knife, and an automatic at his belt with several loaded magazines for the latter in his pocket thus provided if accidentally lost for several days in the forest which often happens to rubber hunters in brazil he'll be provided with the possibility of getting game and making himself shelter and fire at night fish for small fish like the pacu and piranha an ordinary bass hook will do for the latter because of its sharp teeth a hook with a long shank and phosphor bronze leader is the best the same character of leader is best on the hook to be used for the big fish. A tarpon hook will hold most of the great fish of the rivers. A light rod and reel would be a convenience in catching the pacu. We used to fish for the latter variety in the quiet pools while allowing the canoe to drift, and always save some of the fish as bait for the big fellows. We fished for the pacu as the native does, 
kneading a ball of mandioc, farina, with water, and placing it on the hook as bait. I should not be surprised, though, if it were possible, with carefully chosen flies, to catch some of the fish that every once in a while we saw rise to the surface and drag some luckless insect under. CLOTHING even the experienced traveler, when going into a new field, will commit the crime of carrying too much luggage. Articles which he thought to be camp necessities become camp nuisances which worry his men and kill his mules. The lighter one can travel, the better. In the matter of clothing, before the actual wilderness is reached, the costume one would wear to business in New York in summer is practical for most of South America, except, of course, the high mountain regions, where a warm wrap is necessary. A white or natural linen suit is a very comfortable garment. A light blue unlined serge is desirable as a change and for wear in rainy weather. Strange to relate, the South American seems to have a fondness for stiff collars. Even in Colombia, the hottest place I have ever been in, the native does not think he is dressed unless he wears one of the stiff abominations around his throat. A light negligee shirt with interchangeable or attached soft collars is vastly preferred. In the frontier regions and along the rivers, the pajama seems to be the conventional garment for day as well as nightwear. Several such suits of light material should be carried. The more ornamented and beautifully colored, the greater favor will they find along the way. A light cravenetted Macintosh is necessary for occasional cool evenings and as a protection against the rain. It should have no cemented rubber seams to open up in the warm, moist climate. Yachting Oxfords and a light pair of leather slippers complete the outfit for steamer travel. For the field, two or three light woolen khaki-colored shirts made with two breast pockets with button flaps, two pair of long khaki trousers, two pairs of riding breeches, a khaki coat cut military fashion with four pockets with button flaps, two suits of pajamas, handkerchiefs, socks, etc. would be necessary. The poncho should extend to below the knees and should be provided with a hood large enough to cover the helmet. It should have no cemented seams. The material recently adopted by the United States Army for ponchos seems to be the best. For footgear, the traveler needs two pairs of stout, high hunting shoes built on the moccasin form with soles. Hobnails should be taken along to insert if the going is over rocky places. It is also advisable to provide a pair of very light leather slipper boots to reach just under the knee for wear in camp. They protect the legs and ankles from insect stings and bites. The traveler who enters tropical South America should protect his head with a wide-brimmed, soft felt hat with ventilated headband, or the best and lightest pith helmet that can be secured. Head nets with face plates of horsehair are the best protection against small insect pests. They are generally made too small, and the purchaser should be careful to get one large enough to go over his helmet and come down to the breast. Several pairs of loose gloves, rather long in the wrist, will be needed as protection against the flies, PMs, and boroshutas, which draw blood with every bite and are numerous in many parts of South America. A waterproof sun umbrella, with a jointed handle about six feet long, terminating in a point, would be a decided help to the scientist at work in the field. A fine mesh net fitting around the edge of the umbrella would make it insect proof. When folded, it would not be bulky and its weight would be negligible. Such an umbrella could also be attached with a special clamp to the thwart of a canoe and so prove a protection from both sun and rain. There are little personal conveniences which sometimes grow into necessities. One of these in my own case is a little electric flashlight taken for the purpose of reading the verniers of a theodolite or sextant in star observations. It was used every night and for many purposes. As a matter of necessity, where insects are numerous, one turns to the protection of his hammock and net immediately after the evening meal. It was at such times I found that the electric lamp was so helpful. Reclining in the hammock, I held the stock of the light under my left arm and with a diary in my lap wrote up my records for the day. I sometimes read by its soft, steady light. One charge of the battery, to my surprise, lasted nearly a month. When forced to pick out a camping spot after dark, an experience which comes to every traveler in the tropics in the rainy season, we found this light to be very helpful. Neither rain nor wind could put it out, and the light could be directed wherever needed. The charges should be calculated on the plan of one every three weeks. The acetylene lamp for camp illumination is an advance over the kerosene lantern. 
it has been found that for equal weight the carbide will give more light than kerosene or candle. The carbide should be put in small containers, for each time a box is opened, some of the contents turns into gas from contact with the moist air. Tools Three or four good axes, several bill hooks, a good hatchet with hammerhead, and nail puller should be in the tool kit. In addition, each man should be provided with belt knife and machete with sheath. Collins makes the best matches. His axes, too, are excellent. The bill hook, called foice in Brazil, is the most valuable tool for clearing away small trees, vines, and undergrowths. It is marvelous how quickly an experienced hand can clear the ground in a forest with one of these instruments. All of these tools should have handles of second growth American hickory of first quality, and several extra handles should be taken along. The list of tools should be completed with a small outfit of pliers, tweezers, files, etc. The character, of course, depending upon the mechanical ability of the traveler and the scientific instruments he has with him that might need repairs. Survey Instruments The choice of instruments will depend largely upon the character of the work intended. If a compass survey will suffice, there is nothing better than the cavalry sketching board used in the United States Army for reconnaissance. With a careful hand, it approaches the high degree of perfection attained by the plane table method. It is particularly adapted for river survey, and after one gets accustomed to its use, it is very simple. If the prismatic compass is preferred, nothing smaller than two and one half inches in diameter should be used. In the smaller sizes, the magnet is not powerful enough to move the dial quickly or accurately. Several good pocket compasses must be provided. They should all have good sized needles with the north end well marked and degrees engraved in metal. If the floating dial is preferred, it should be of aluminum and nothing smaller than two and one half inches for the same reason as mentioned above regarding the prismatic compass. Expense should not be spared if it is necessary to secure good compasses. Avoid paper dials and leather cases which absorb moisture. The compass case should allow taking apart for cleaning and drying. The regular chronometer movement, because of its delicacy, is out of the question for rough land or water travel. We had with us a small-sized half-chronometer movement recently brought out by the Waltham Company as a yacht chronometer. It gave a surprisingly even rate under the most adverse conditions. I was sorry to lose it in the rapids of the Papagal when our canoes went down. The watches should be waterproof with strong cases, and several should be taken. It would be well to have a dozen cheap but good watches and the same number of compasses for use around camp and for gifts or trade along the line of travel. Money is of no value after one leaves the settlements. I was surprised to find that many of the rubber hunters were not provided with compasses, and I listened to an American who told of having been lost in the depths of the great forest where for days he lived on monkey meat secured with his rifle until he found his way to the river. He had no compass and could not get one. I was sorry I had none to give. I had lost mine in the rapids. For the determination of latitude and longitude, there is nothing better than a small four or five inch theodolite, not over fifteen pounds in weight. It should have a good prism eyepiece with an angle tube attached, so it would not be necessary to break one's neck in reading high altitudes. For days we traveled in the direction the sun was going, with altitudes varying from eighty-eight degrees to ninety degrees. Because of these high altitudes of the sun, the sextant with artificial horizon could not be used unless one depended upon star observations altogether, an uncertain dependence because of the many cloudy nights. Barometers Goldsmith form of direct reading aneroid is the most accurate portable instrument, and of course should be compared with the standard mercurial at the last weather bureau station. Thermometers a swing thermometer with wet and dry bulbs for determination of the amount of moisture in the air and the maximum and minimum thermometer of the signal service or weather bureau type should be provided with a case to protect them from injury. A tape measure with metric scale of measurements on one side and feet and inches on the other is most important. Two small, light, waterproof cases could be constructed and packed with scientific instruments data and spare clothing and yet not exceed the weight limit of flotation. In transit by pack train these two cases would form but one mule load. Photographic. 
from the experience gained in several fields of exploration, it seems to me that the voyager should limit himself to one small-sized camera, which he can always have with him, and then carry a duplicate of it soldered in tin in the baggage. The duplicate need not be equipped with as expensive a lens and shutter as the camera carried for work. Three and one quarter by four and one quarter is a good size. Nothing larger than three and a quarter by five and a half is advised. We carried the 3A special Kodak and found it a light, strong, and efficient instrument. It seems to me that the ideal form of instrument would be one with a front board large enough to contain an adapter fitted for three lenses. For the three and one quarter by four and one quarter, one lens four or four and a half focus, one lens six or seven focus, one lens telephoto or telecentric nine to twelve focus. The camera should be made of metal and fitted with a focal plane shutter and direct viewfinder. A sole leather case with shoulder strap should contain the camera and lenses with an extra roll of films, all with an instant reach so that a lens could be changed without any loss of time. Plates, of course, are the best, but their weight and frailty, with difficulty of handling, rule them out of the question. The roll film is the best, as the film pack sticks together and the stubs pull off in the moist, hot climate. The films should be purchased in rolls of six exposures, each roll in a tin, the cover sealed with surgical tape. Twelve of these tubes should be soldered in a tin box. In places where the air is charged with moisture, a roll of film should not be left in a camera for over 24 hours. Tank development is best for the field. The tanks provided for developing by the Kodak Company are the best for fixing also. A nest of tanks would be a convenience. One tank should be kept separate for the fixing bath. As suggested in the Kodak Circular, for tropical development, a large size tank can be used for holding the freezing mixture of hypo. The same tank would become the fixing tank after development. In the rainy season, it is a difficult matter to dry films. Development in the field, with washing water at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, is a patient's trying operation. It has occurred to me that a small air pump with a supply of chloride of calcium in small tubes might solve the problem of preserving films in the tropics. The air pump and supply of chloride of calcium would not be as heavy or bulky as the tanks and powders needed for development. By means of the air pump, the films could be sealed in tin tubes free from moisture and kept thus until arrival at home or at a city where the air was fairly dry and cold water for washing could be had. While I cordially agree with most of the views expressed by Mr. Fiala, there are some as to which I disagree. For instance, we came very strongly to the conclusion in descending the Divida, where bulk was of great consequence, that the films should be in rolls of ten or twelve exposures. I doubt whether the four-barrel gun would be practical, but this is a matter of personal taste. Appendix C My letter of May 1 to General Lauro Muir the first report on the expedition made by me immediately after my arrival at Manos and published in Rio de Janeiro upon its receipt is as follows. May 1, 1914. To His Excellency, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Rio de Janeiro. My dear General Lauro Mueller, I first wish to express my profound acknowledgments to you personally and to the other members of the Brazilian government whose generous courtesy alone rendered possible the Expeditio Scientifica Roosevelt Rondon. I wish also to express my high admiration and regard for Colonel Rondon and his associates who have been my colleagues in this work of exploration. In the third place, I wish to point out that what we have just done was rendered possible only by the hard and perilous labor of the Brazilian Telegraphic Commission in the unexplored western wilderness of Mato Grosso during the last seven years. We have had a hard and somewhat dangerous but very successful trip. No less than six weeks were spent in slowly and with great peril and exhausting labor, forcing our way down through what seemed literally endless succession of rapids and cataracts. For forty-eight days we saw no human being. In passing these rapids, we lost five of the seven canoes with which we started and had to build others. One of our best men lost his life in the rapids. Under the strain, one of the men went completely bad, shirked all his work, stole his comrade's food, and when punished by the sergeant, he with cold-blooded deliberation murdered the sergeant and fled into the wilderness. 
Colonel Rondon's dog, running ahead of him while hunting, was shot by two Indians. By his death he in all probability saved the life of his master. We have put on the map a river about 1,500 kilometers in length, running from just south of the 13th degree to north of the 5th degree, and the biggest affluent of the Madeira. Until now, its upper course has been utterly unknown to everyone, and its lower course, although known for years to the rubbermen, utterly unknown to all cartographers. Its source is between the 12th and 13th parallels of latitude south, and between longitude 59 degrees and longitude 60 degrees west from Greenwich. We embarked on it at about latitude 12 degrees 1 minute south and longitude 60 degrees 18 west. After that, its entire course was between the 60th and 61st degrees of longitude, approaching the latter most closely about in latitude 8 degrees 15 minutes. The first rapids were at Navite in 11 degrees 44 minutes, and after that they were continuous and very difficult and dangerous until the rapids named after the murdered Sergeant Pichon in 11 degrees 12 minutes. At 11 degrees 23 minutes, the river received the Rio Kermit from the left. At 11 degrees 22 minutes, the Marciano Avila entered it from the right. At 11 degrees 18 minutes, the Tune entered from the left. At 10 degrees 58 minutes, the Cardozo entered from the right. At 10 degrees 24 minutes, we encountered the first rubberman. The Rio Branco entered from the left at 9 degrees 38 minutes. We camped at 8 degrees 49 minutes, or approximately the boundary line between Mato Grosso and the Amazonas. The confluence with the upper Arapuanan, which entered from the right, was in 7 degrees 34 minutes. The mouth where it entered the Madeira was in about 5 degrees 30 minutes. The stream we have followed down is that which rises farthest away from the mouth, and its general course is almost due north. My dear sir, I thank you from my heart for the chance to take part in this great work of exploration. With high regard and respect, believe me, very sincerely yours, Theodore Roosevelt. End of Appendix B End of Through the Brazilian Wilderness by Theodore Roosevelt